Ark Invest, Kathy Wood, and Tasha Keeney just made some pretty big predictions about the future of Tesla's stock price and how Kathy is expecting 2026 to roll out in terms of the markets. I've got two clips for you. These are the type of videos I love. Tasha, I'm going to come to you. Uh, when do you think Tesla's share price may reach that next breakthrough moment? I know we talk about autonomous uh, taxi networks a lot. Thanks, Dan. Um, you know, in, in terms of major catalysts for Tesla, uh, we recently saw on X that Elon said that he expects uh, for Tesla to be able to remove the operator in the vehicle in Austin within the next few weeks. Uh, so, so what does this mean? You know, currently the um, the robot taxi service is autonomous, but there's still someone in the car. They're not in the driver's seat. They're in the passenger seat. But this would be, you know, just the passenger riding in the vehicle. So true autonomy. We do expect there to still be some uh, remote assistance feature. That would be someone outside the car. If the car gets into trouble. Um, but this is a major milestone for Tesla in terms of, you know, improving the autonomous technology to to scale the robot taxi service. And, you know, I say scale because that's really Tesla's advantage here. Um, I mean, let's look at Waymo. Waymo uh, recently announced that they are in, you know, 10 cities now operating. They plan to be in over 20 cities by the end of next year. Um, except they only have single digit thousands of vehicles on the road. Um, I think today we just saw there was a, a recall notice of that would suggest there are roughly 3000 Waymos out there. But, um, you know, I would say single digit thousand safe assumption. Uh, so compare that to what Tesla is able to do. Um, and of course, it depends on what they prioritize versus uh, customer sales and the or the robo taxi fleet. But um, Tesla can produce thousands of cars, you know, in a single day. Um, last quarter, they produced uh, half a million vehicles. So um, Waymo is really paving the way uh, for the regulatory barriers um, and Tesla, while they you know, may, may come second in a city, we think that they have a key advantage in terms of actually scaling the fleet, which really matters to bring the utilization rate down, which means improving the underlying economics, the cost per mile, um, ultimately, you know, off, eventually undercutting today's ride hill prices, which is what we expect to expand the market for robo taxis far past what we see ride hill as today. Um, so as you know, from our published price target, we think that robo taxis will uh, contribute to the, um, what we believe like the majority of the uh, enterprise value of Tesla by 2029, um, you know, and we had assumed $2,600 per share of Tesla at that time. Uh, that's really driven by robo taxis. So this, this operator out is really a pivotal moment. Uh, look forward to that. Look forward to more um, research from us on Optimus and uh, space data centers. But for now, Robotaxis. While ARK's $2,600 price target is driven primarily by Robotaxis, Tesla's next two business lines, humanoid robots and orbital AI data centers, could make autonomy look like a warm up act for what's actually happening. Tasha Keeney concluded her robo-taxi analysis by saying, looking forward to more research from us on Optimus and space data centers. Elon Musk stated at Tesla's shareholder meeting that they're launching the fastest production ramp of any large complex manufacturing product ever, targeting 100 million Optimus units per year and potentially a billion a year. The robotaxi opportunity is genuinely enormous. Tesla can produce half a million vehicles in a single quarter, while Waymo has struggled to reach 3,000 cars across all of their markets combined over nearly a decade. That manufacturing dominance translates directly into better unit economics, lower cost per mile, and the ability to undercut current ride hail prices in ways no competitor can match. Arc's math on robotaxis contributing the majority of Tesla's enterprise value by 2029 is solid analysis based on real advantages Tesla actually has. What makes Tasha's closing comment so interesting though is that Arc still explicitly excludes Optimus from their valuation models. Most analysts justify this by saying humanoid robots won't meaningfully impact Tesla's business within their forecast timeline. They might be right about the timing, but they're almost certainly wrong about the magnitude. Elon recently announced plans for a million unit production line in Fremont as line one 
followed by a 10 million unit line and then eventually a 100 million unit facility that he joked might need to be on Mars. These aren't casual numbers thrown around for headlines. Tesla already manufactures complicated robotic systems at scale. Every vehicle they produce is essentially a four-wheeled robot with batteries, power electronics, motors, AI chips, and vision-based autonomy. The Optimus Humanoid is the same architecture with arms and legs instead of wheels. Not financial advice, but the potential financial implications get absurd very quickly when you actually model them out. Assume Tesla reaches just 10 million Optimus units per year, far below their stated goals, and let's say each sells for $25,000, that's $250 billion in hardware revenue annually. Now add a conservative $1,000 per month software subscription for operating these robots, which is a fraction of what businesses would pay for equivalent human labor, that's another $120 billion per year in reoccurring revenue. High margin revenue from just one year's production. Run those robots for a decade and you're looking at over a trillion dollars in cumulative software revenue from a single year's manufacturing output. Scale that to 100 million units and the numbers become genuinely incomprehensible. Space data centers represent an equally enormous opportunity, which not many people are covering. The physics actually work better in orbit than on Earth. Cooling is essentially free because you just radiate heat into the vacuum of space. Power is free and available 24 hours a day from solar panels. Latency can also actually be lower because laser communication through a vacuum is faster than fiber optics through glass. SpaceX has 10,000 Starlink satellites in orbit right now and can deploy many, many more. Each satellite could carry inference chips, which means potentially there's a path to millions of inference chips processing AI workloads in space, powered by free energy with cooling that costs nothing. Tesla is designing AI chips that Elon says will eventually exceed all other AI chips combined in production volume. Those chips will end up in data centers on Earth, in Optus Robot, in Tesla vehicles, and increasingly in orbitable compute platforms. The pieces are all connecting in a way I don't think most people are fully aware of. So when Ark says robotaxis will drive Tesla to $2,600 by 2029, they probably think that's the floor for all the company whose next two products could be larger than the entire autonomous vehicle market. Next up, we have a huge clip from Kathy Wood, who is about to break down the biggest risks facing the economy heading into 2026, and her conclusion might surprise you. She's actually incredibly bullish on what's coming, but only if the Trump administration can execute on a very specific playbook. The risks she outlines aren't about recession or collapse, they're about whether politicians can resist the temptation to mess things up when the economic engine is already firing on all cylinders. What do you think are the biggest fiscal and monetary risks potentially next year? I'll start with monetary. Um, I think if we were going to, if the Fed were going to be populated uh, by individuals who believe that growth is inflationary, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of dissension on the Fed, I think that would be an issue. Um, I think if Kevin Hassett uh, or Governor Waller, uh, either one of them is at the helm next year, I don't think that will be a problem, though the voters uh, could dissent uh, and, and cause a lot of uncertainty in the market. Um, I'm already hearing the administration including Howard Lutnick uh, very recently on CNBC, talk about growth not being inflationary. In, quite, in fact, quite the opposite uh, in the 80s and 90s, as uh, real GDP growth was picking up, uh, inflation did come down consistently. And uh, I think we're going to see that again as the supply shock uh, associated with COVID and tariffs to some extent as they pass through the system and, uh, and we move to the other side of um, all of that confusion. Um, in terms of fiscal policy, um, I think if, if the Trump administration uh, is not enjoying a, a strong growth environment with inflation and interest rates falling, uh, it, it, 
President Trump could become more of a lame duck uh, sooner than we expect, meaning uh, he'll probably be challenged from a tax policy point of view. We love the tax policies, the, corp the effective corporate tax rate coming down to 10 percent uh, and uh, individuals uh, enjoying big refunds this year because of no tax on tips, uh, uh, overtime, uh, large parts of Social Security, the doubling of the, the SALT deduction and, and uh, uh, child care tax credits. Um, but if, if we're in a weak economy, uh, we're going to get a, a, a lot of angst around the midterm elections. And, you know, uh, we, we could see flailing around with, you know, new temporary spending measures, which is the last thing we need. Uh, we really need to grow out of the deficit. And uh, I do believe this administration has put in place policies to do just that. But if for some reason we're wrong on that, um, uh, the deficit uh, will become a problem for, for the bond markets. Kathy believes the Federal Reserve's biggest risk is appointing leaders who think economic growth causes inflation when historical evidence from the 80s and 90s shows the exact opposite relationship. The conventional wisdom on Wall Street says that when the economy grows too fast, inflation follows. More jobs means more spending means higher prices. The Fed has operated under this assumption for decades, raising interest rates whenever growth accelerates to prevent the economy from overheating. Kathy is pushing back hard on this framework. She's pointing to a multi-decade period where strong GDP growth coincided with falling inflation, not rising inflation. The 80s and 90s saw robust economic expansion, while inflation steadily declined from double digits to low single digits. So in Kathy's mind, growth and price stability can absolutely coexist. The mechanism she's describing relates to supply and demand dynamics. When businesses invest and expand, they increase the supply of goods and services. More supply relative to demand puts downward pressure on prices. Productivity improvements from technology and capital investments mean more output per worker, which further reduces costs. The inflation of the past few years came from supply shocks, COVID disrupting manufacturing, shipping delays, and energy constraints. These are temporary disruptions that pass through the system, not permanent structural changes requiring indefinite high interest rates. The tariff situation adds another layer of complexity. Kathy acknowledges that tariffs can cause temporary price increases as they pass through the system. A one-time price adjustment from import duties is fundamentally different from sustained inflation driven by monetary policy. Once businesses adjust their supply chains and their prices reset, the inflationary impacts fade. Her thought is the Fed shouldn't treat temporary supply side adjustments the same way they treat demand driven price spirals. Getting this decision wrong could lead to over tightening that damages growth unnecessarily. If you've been meaning to get a proper understanding of AI, I built a course that teaches everything from first principles to more advanced ideas in a simple, approachable way. Once you join, you'll get lifetime access and pricing will go up each time we add new modules. So if you want in at the lowest price, now is that moment. Check the link in the description. YouTube isn't just entertainment, it's one of the best client acquisition tools because it builds trust at scale. We've helped businesses grow from scratch to a $100,000 a month just by launching them a YouTube channel. Book a call with me below and let's see how YouTube could help your business scale.